I'm Jamie Floyd. Welcome to TED Talks in NYC, the series that brings TED.com celebrated conversations to television and keeps the conversation going with some of the brightest minds in New York City. This week's show is all about the news, which events are making headlines, who decides what's news, and why. We begin with a TED Talk from Elisa Miller, the CEO of Public Radio International, and she's concerned the press isn't doing its job. How does the news shape the way we see the world? Here's the world based on the way it looks, based on landmass. And here's how news shapes what Americans see. <laughs> this map. <laughs> This map shows the number of seconds that American network and cable news organizations dedicated to news stories by country in February of 2007, just one year ago. Now, this was a month when North Korea agreed to dismantle its nuclear facilities. There was massive flooding in Indonesia. And in Paris, the IPCC released its study confirming man's impact on global warming. The U.S. accounted for 79% of total news coverage. And when we take out the U.S. and look at the remaining 21%, we see a lot of Iraq, that's that big green thing there, and little else. The combined coverage of Russia, China, and India, for example, reached just 1%. When we analyzed all the news stories, and removed just one story. Here's how the world looked. What was that story? The death of Anna Nicole Smith. <laughs> this story eclipsed every country except Iraq and received 10 times the coverage of the IPCC report. And this cycle continues. As we all know, Brittany has loomed pretty large lately. So why don't we hear more about the world? One reason is that news networks have reduced the number of their foreign bureaus by half. Aside from one person, ABC mini bureaus in Nairobi, New Delhi, and Mumbai, there are no network news bureaus in all of Africa, India, or South America, places that are home to more than two billion people. The reality is, is that covering Britney is cheaper. And this lack of global coverage is all the more disturbing when we see where people go for news. Local TV news looms large, and unfortunately only dedicates 12% of its coverage to international news. And what about the web? The most popular news sites don't do much better. Last year, Pew and the Columbia J School analyzed the 14,000 stories that appeared on Google News' front page, and they, in fact, covered the same 24 news events. Similarly, a study in e-content showed that much of global news from U.S. news creators is recycled stories from the AP wire services and Reuters, and don't put things into a context that people can understand their connection to it. So, if you put it all together, this could help explain why today's college graduates, as well as less educated Americans, know less about the world than their counterparts did 20 years ago. And if you think that it's simply because we are not interested, you would be wrong. In recent years, Americans who say they closely follow global news most of the time grew to over 50%. The real question, is this distorted worldview what we want for Americans in our increasingly interconnected world? I know we can do better, and can we afford not to? Thank you. Thank you.
a whole lot to think about there. And for more perspective on this TED Talk, I'm joined now by New York Times reporter and multimedia journalist Tanzina Vega, PBS and NPR journalist Rick Carr of the Columbia School of Journalism. Rick is also the host of NYC 2.0, a technology show which airs right here on NYC Life. And Celeste Headley, co-host of WNYC Radio's The Takeaway. Welcome to all of you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So, Celeste Headley, let me start with you. Elisa Miller talks about global news and says that Americans just aren't getting enough of it. What, in your opinion, is global news, and do you agree with her premise? First, a quick disclaimer. Elisa Miller is the CEO yes. of Public Radio National, Fair which is enough. my network. <laughs> <laughs> should say that first. You know, yes, I think that people do are, are hungry for a lot of global news, and I think they're very hungry for in-depth global news that gives them perspective. I think if we've learned nothing else from the European debt crisis and how it's affecting our own markets and how our own recession has affected the European markets and all the ways in which we're connected, which I guess we, we knew but didn't accept in years before, I think we're all beginning to discover the ways in which globalization has made global news even more so than ever before, more local than ever. I'm not sure I agree that people aren't getting it. I mean, I, I think that we're, they're not just not consuming news in the traditional ways that they used to. I mean, people subscribe to 500 different Twitter feeds, and they've got different newspapers sending them podcasts and sending them the articles that they think that they'll be interested in. They go to Google News, which gives them a whole ver variety of stories um, that they check in on their homepage every single day. I think people are actually more connected than ever before. And, and this is what uh, Elisa suggests, right, Rick, that uh, there are new sources of news, that uh, you can go to the web for news. I I is that right? Is, well, is that where we're going now, to the Internet for our news, global and other news? I, I think so. I mean, you know, we talk about what Celeste was just saying. There used to be, you know, we talk about the golden age of television, three networks, plus PBS, maybe you had a couple of daily newspapers in your hometown, maybe you had a couple of radio stations that did news, there wasn't that much there. We now have, I don't want to say infinite, but we have a huge number of choices. I mean, look at the number of page hits that Al Jazeera English gets from the United States. Um, you know, she talked about the floods in Indonesia. I know because I have a friend who works for the Jakarta Post, the English language paper in Jakarta, their hits spiked from the United States when that happened. So I think younger consumers of news get it. They know where to find it. They know that by watching the news at 11, they're not going to get global news. Mm -hmm. They are hungry for it. They know where to find it. You work for the Old Grey Lady, the New York Times, but your focus in large part is the digital world, the digital future. How is uh, the brave new world of online reporting affecting our business, uh, our profession, if you will, of journalism? Well, I think one of the things we need to address also are the budgetary uh, constraints that all of us have been facing, and the Times has not been exempt. Uh, we've had layoffs. We've had buyouts. Uh, this is something that's affecting news organizations across the board. And Elisa um, touches on this in her talk, absolutely, shrinking resources, absolutely. shrinking news budgets. It's not cheap to report from Iraq. It's not cheap to report from Afghanistan. We have boots on the ground in both of those areas, and a lot of other news organizations have been forced to pare back on those resources. Uh, to us, it's something that we consider critical, part of our reporting. Uh, we're, but we have also been hit by, by these budgetary constraints. And I think you're seeing it. Advertising is not um, coming back in print. So these larger uh, newspapers and some of the regional papers have obviously been hit by that severely. You're seeing cuts in newsrooms across the board, including the New York Times. We've paired back. Our news uh, editors and reporters have been forced to, to, uh, to uh, take lay layoffs and buyouts. And this isn't something that, that anyone, I think, wants to do, but it's, it's a concern of whether or not advertising is going to bounce back. We're not seeing the bounce back in print. We are seeing traction in digital, but it hasn't filled the gap. And so until we do that, and then we have new models like, like pay models, right? So where are these, which the Times has recently subscribed to, and we're hoping that, you know, for lack of a better word, that other folks do the same. Um, but this is something that we need to fill the gap. Quality journalism is not cheap, and it can't be done for free. But, you know, I mean, the New York Times is a really good example, um, although they're late to the game like every other print media. Um, is, is, a, is a good example of finally understanding that they have to diversify and that, that 
hard copy paper that you pick up at Starbucks or whatever is not the future of the New York Times. I mean, our partnership with the New York Times is a really great example of that. I mean, on the takeaway. On sure. the takeaway, we bring New York Times reporters on all the time from all over the world. That means that their report is not just being seen on the New York Times site or on the New York Times website. It's also being tweeted by our show. It's also going onto our website. And it's going out to, you know, hundreds of thousands of listeners who listen to the takeaway all the time. I want to ask you about the takeaway, though, because in addition to the partnership with the Times, it's really an effort to uh, be a fully integrated program. It's on radio. You have partnerships with other outlets, traditional outlets, yeah. but also an effort to use Twitter, uh, to have people uh, participate in a, in a more tra uh, non-traditional way, actively engaged with the broadcast in a way that wouldn't have been possible in the non-digital age, right? Absolutely. How is that working? Is it? Is it? It's uh, a scary is thing there a convergence? Is there a convergence? <laughs> there is. And you know, I mean, I, I, I'm sure these two can attest. That's a scary thing. We're very sometimes afraid of what's going to happen if we do stuff live and if we let listeners come on and, and have their say. You're and always if afraid. We lose control. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. But it mm -hmm. turns out, you know, surprise, surprise, most of the people that listen to public radio, at least, are really articulate and engaged and have very thoughtful things to say. So there are the real engagers, the ones who actually do the participating, and then the rest of us who perhaps listen more passively the way we always did. And what ends up happening is that we end up with this conversation, and it's not just national. We have listeners who podcast from all over the world. You start getting this conversation of news consumers from all over the place. And then we'll take a question from somebody in Ohio, and I'll have the Ohio senator on with me, and I'll say, okay, okay, well, we have a question from someone in your district. They say this. Mm -hmm. what, how do you answer that? Now, now, let's get back to this question. There are two issues. There's the business of journalism. Yes. There's the profession of journalism. Rick, let me come back over to you, have you put your Columbia journalism hat on for a moment. Let, let's talk a little bit about content online, mm -hmm. because we are talking more, about, more and more about consumers going to the Internet. Uh, what about uh, the quality of journalism online? Because we, we know over the course of the last decade, uh, more and more bloggers can just pick up uh, their computer and report what they see, an accident they see on the highway. Uh, they can be at the Democratic National Convention and blog about what they observe. Uh, they don't have to be trained as journalists. They don't have to have gone to journalism school, although none of us really have had to do that, to be journalists. Uh, what about the quality of content and how does the news consumer know uh, that what they're getting is uh, as good a, as the content they always received, or did they ever know they could trust uh, they, that they, they never knew. They never knew. And, you know, when we talk about sort of standards of fairness and balance, uh, not to rip off Fox News' slogan, but talk about fair and balanced news, that's really only something that's existed in the United States for the past 60 years or so. I mean, it really only started in the Depression, carried on through the post-war period. Prior to that, newspapers in particular were blatantly partisan. Mm. You have papers that have the word Democrat or Republican, or in one case, Whig, in the name of the paper. So you knew what you were getting insofar as they supported certain partisan aims, but in other cases you might not have known. You were probably reading multiple daily papers to get multiple perspectives if that's what you wanted. I think we've kind of gone back to that now. You don't necessarily know when you're reading a blogger, but I think that overall the amount of information that's out there is fantastic. I mean, there's, there's a blog I read daily that covers my neighborhood in Brooklyn. It covers Greenpoint. That's all that it covers. I don't, the, the Times would never have had a Greenpoint stringer. The Times never would have dedicated multiple column inches of copy per day to community board meetings or police community outreach meetings in my neighborhood. Now, do I know that I can trust everything that this blogger says when she writes? Not necessarily until I get to read her more, but when she's posting video of these community board meetings, that's awesome. So well, what about Elisa Miller's, uh, Miller's point uh, that, that the web doesn't do a very good job at covering news and neither does local, neither does cable, uh, that, that there really does need to be some sort of con concerted effort, some co consortium that, that tries to get at the real stories that matter, I think the especially the global news yeah, stories. I, I was just going to say, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, I think just speaking from the Times' perspective, our internal processes have developed along with the internet and the web and how we produce our report online. I mean, this is an evolving conversation. We have set up entire units of editors to focus specifically on blog posts. 
Every, you know, I, I often get pitched and someone might say, oh, this is, we want this for a print exclusive. Well, there's no such thing as a print exclusive. Everything we're leading with the web is leading with the web. Content will be published on the web before it's published in the paper. And so this idea that the two are somehow separate is, 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 is misinformed, at least from our st uh, standpoint. When you're looking at blog posts, people would say, well, are, do you have the same standards as you would for an article? Absolutely. And there are, ba are editors that are in place to backstop any grammatical errors, any standards issues that might arise on the blog or, or multiple blogs that we have. Oftentimes, blog posts are breaking news. Oftentimes, blog posts are the first version of an article that you'll later see in the paper. And to flip that, we also have dedicated space in the paper for the blog posts that we that we run, say, you know, the best of uh, from each of these blogs, and at least in the business section. So there are absolutely standards that we put in place. And are we perfect? No, but it's an evolving conversation. And I think we internally recognize the need to maintain time standards online and offline. Although, you know, to, to take Elisa's point a little bit broader, I, I think that th there is a responsibility to the consumer, absolutely. But as journalists, we have a responsibility for our own integrity to make sure that we're trying to, to, to cover those stories that simply are not being covered. I mean, for minorities, the mainstream media, and I'm, my mainstream, I'm including the New York Times and NPR, and PRI for that matter, um, has done a terrible job of covering minority stories, and often a terrible job of covering poverty. I mean, it's much more anthropological than it is in any way, shape, or form informed and contextual. And I, I think that f as each one of us goes through our editorial process, choosing which stories go on to the, into the paper or onto the show every single day, uh, we have these arguments on the show all the time, where I'm saying, are you crazy? We don't need to reproduce what the New York Times has in their front page or the Washington Post. That's what everyone's talking about. Let's get to that story, which is incredible incredibly important to those people in Iowa or those people in North Dakota and life or death for them and it's not going to get covered anywhere else. That's our responsibility and that is that's one, in one way in which the mainstream media is not doing its job. And I think and I take to, 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 to touch on that point about coverage, I think what you're seeing now online are a lot of news outlets, I guess websites if you want to call them, that are focused on black Americans, focused on Latino Americans, focused on gay Americans. I mean, there are, the web has sort of democratized that process and saying, you know what, the Times might not be doing it, but we're going to do it. But we're going to set up an entire channel yes. to dedicated to issues affecting these specific communities. And I think they can't, they, they, they can't be ignored anymore. But you also see within uh, larger organizations like the Huffington Post, you see now black voices, uh, we see the root, uh, mm -hmm. but that also leads to a ghettoization. Absolutely. And it relieves responsibility within Absolutely. traditional news organizations like the Times, like NPR, and the main org the main networks that we, we mentioned, the big three, ABC, CBS, NBC. Uh, they can feel some relief from the responsibility to cover those issues because someone else is handling well, it. Well, I think, I think it also speaks to, I agree, I think it also speaks to the lack of diversity in a lot of newsrooms. If you look at the American Society of News Editors report, annual report, this is the third year in a row that minority representation across the board, Latinos, Asians, African Americans, has declined in newsrooms across the country. So this is something that's endemic to our newsrooms as a whole. And, and mainstream media, small newspapers, regional papers, we're all being affected by by the lack of diversity in And there's in a newsrooms. danger here. And I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm talking too much. I don't want to mean to dominate the conversation. But I, let me just tell you a quick story that, for me, illustrates the danger here. You know, my grandfather was a co famous composer. Uh, he was the dean of African American composers. And a long time ago, 70 or 80 years ago, he conducted uh, the L.A. Phil at the Hollywood Bowl in a concert of his own works. Okay. And... They didn't. This is at a time when they didn't even allow people, black people, into Hollywood Bowl. They had a special Negro night. So and and people who don't know the Hollywood Bowl should understand this is a very, very significant place Absolutely. and event. Uh, people who don't know the West Coast should know that Absolutely. it's hugely significant. So uh, he he conducted this concert, and none of the white papers covered it. They left that to the minority papers. So all of the black papers, all of the African American papers, all the diverse papers covered this event. Headline, you know, huge deal. Um, later, when they went back to write textbooks and they were doing the research on this, they didn't find any mention of it because what papers did they check? They checked the L.A. Times so and all the major falls papers. out of history. Yeah, so they, they said the first African-American conducted a major symphony was this guy up in Seattle in the 1960s. And my grandmother said, I 
I think not. <laughs> and she showed they didn't believe her. She had to show them programs of the actual performance. And this is the problem with what you were calling the ghettoization of news, is because it is a shooing responsibility, as though there is news which is black, mm -hmm. but it's not white, as though there is news that is Latino and not white, or Asian and not white. It's all just news. But all of this assumes, and Rick, I want to come to you on this question, it gets to a fundamental assumption we're making, and that is that journalism is a profession that it is a profession, as medicine is a profession, a as law is a profession, with standards and codes of responsibility uh, that, that you study in school and, and that we adhere to a certain, uh, we, you know, we, we go back and we check ourselves, we all follow the same rules and someone is looking over our shoulder. Is it a profession as are other professions or are we making a little too much of no, ourselves? No, no, and it, it can't be like that because it's like, look, to practice law, you have to pass the bar exam. To practice medicine, you have to pa pass your board exam. I don't want to live in a country where you have to pass an exam to be a journalist. I, I don't think that that's just wrong, right? You know, anybody should be able to pipe up and say, I'm a journalist, and if you find an audience, then you're a journalist. Now, why is that? Because of the First Amendment? Because of the necessity of a fourth well, estate, we, a democracy? All we are is professional observers and storytellers. That's what we do. Once you start saying that there has to be some kind of professional standard in order to observe things and tell stories, what kind of society are you living in then? I mean, that's like Soviet style. That's, that's so scary. So Jason Blair shouldn't have been fired? No, I didn't say that. I said but that's that Jason, a, that's Jason, to Jason, to a Jason Blair, Jason Blair, anybody could have hired Jason Blair after he was fired. I, I'm saying we observe and we tell stories. Now, if you're not observing, and you're making stuff up, then you're a fiction writer, and then the organization that's hired you that is ostensibly a nonfiction publisher of stories has every right to say, uh, that's fiction, that's not what we do. Go talk to Knopf. <laughs> you know, that's not what we do. No, I'm, what I'm saying is Jason, Jason Blair should never have had to pass an exam in order to carry a license that says, I am a journalist. None of us should have to do that. I have to ask, and we're very tight on time, but I have to ask about social media. And let me come back to you, Genzina. What about the effect on, of social media on telling these stories uh, that, that Rick is talking about? Uh, because it has, we see in the Arab Spring, it has democratized the spreading of news, but it can also lead to misinformation, can't it? Absolutely. I think the consumer at the end of the day has to be literate about the sources that they are reading. I think what it does, however, is it's not going away. And we have got to learn how to coexist with social media. The Times has to do it. The journalists at the Times have to do it. We do it for our sections. We have Twitter handles for pretty much every bit of content that we put out there. But we also, there's a symbiotic relationship that we're creating. We're listening to the conversation. We're blogging about what's happening out there. And the same thing is happening back and forth. So there is no way to really shut that off. And anyone who says, you know, they're not going to pay attention to social, they don't want to be involved in social, is, is making a really serious error. These are the, 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 there's a wisdom of the crowd that happens in social media, right? So there's this fear that, um, in, in, on one level, the Times can help curate. Right, a lot of these voices for readers who might feel more trust with the New York Times than they might say some random Twitter handle that they don't recognize, fine. But there's another thing outside of the Times which is really the wisdom of the crowd. And as news can break on social, news can break on Twitter, news can break on Facebook, untruths can also be quickly fettered out on, on social because the wisdom of the crowd will say, you know, I don't really think this person is, is, is accurate. Or how about following this person who's on the ground? I mean, you're seeing with the, you know, some of the protests in Occupy Wall Street, you saw it with the Arab Spring, you know, just without following necessarily a Times reporter, there were people pointing to folks who were saying, you know, this guy's really doing a great job. He's been on the ground since day one. Why don't we follow him? And so the wisdom of the crowd, I think, is powerful enough in social media to be able to help filter out some of the untruths. Are they out there? Absolutely. Yeah. Let me ask each of you to give me a quick answer to this question. What current news story or story in the last year or so do you think will stand the test of time? One for the history books, if you will. Tanzina, first to you. I'm going to say the economy. I know lots of people might disagree with me. I don't think, I mean, we're still talking about the Great Depression today. Great. We were talking about the Great Depression before we hit our recession and depression. This is something that is affecting social change, political change, affecting the way we live, the way we interact with each other, the relationships that we're choosing to have with other people. I don't think this is something that's going to go away and it's going to, it, it, it very well may have profound and lasting effects so, so, socially speaking. So I think it's the economy. And informing so many other stories as well. Absolutely. Rick? 
Uh, I think it's the fact that we no longer have majority rule in the Congress. I think the fact that 40 senators can kill any bill, uh, that's not healthy for a democratic republic. And I think it's not getting enough attention now as a story. Not, not getting any not, attention. Right? Almost none, but I think 100 years from now, people are going to look back and say, yeah, that was a huge issue. Which feeds into what I think may end up in the history books, which is the sunset of the United States as, as the superpower of the globe. That would certainly be one for the history books. Absolutely. One we would talk about in the next millennium. Uh, we'll see how, where it goes, but that's kind of what I'm thinking we're watching. Well, thanks to all of you, Celeste, Rick, Tanzina. I appreciate your being here today to talk about the future of news. You're thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Kirk Citron has his own thoughts about which news events will stand the test of time. He's the editor of The Long News. It's a website devoted to stories he thinks will matter in the next millennium. We leave you with his TED Talk. It's called, And Now the Real News, followed by opinions from some of our other TED Show panelists. Thanks for watching. I'm Jamie Floyd. Join me next time for more compelling conversations on TED Talks in NYC. <laughs>
the death of Steve Jobs. The fall of the Western world? I thought it was multiple choice. <laughs> <laughs> the Afghanistan war is certainly going to make it into history books. The decline of global fisheries. Saving the Garmin district. It is ultimately one of the most important things we can do for ourselves here in New York, but also for the nation as a whole. The election of the first African-American president, President Barack Obama.